Welcome to the one and only Interior Design Book Podcast. Decorating by the Book, hosted by Susie Chase from her dining room table in New York City. Join Susie for conversations about the latest and greatest interior design books with the authors who wrote them. I'm Stuart Manger. My latest book is Romancing the Home, published with Rizzoli. I am dying to know, how has the title of your book not been snapped up already? Romancing the Home is the best title ever. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm not really sure why it had not been snapped up, but we did do uh, a search before just to make sure it had not been taken because the last thing you want is when people go searching for your book, Googling it or looking for it on Amazon, that another book comes up instead of yours. So I was thrilled that it was available. Yeah, I was shocked. So good. So for each of the 13 projects in this book that range from Majorca to New England to London to Southampton, New York, you single out a theme that influences the entire design. Talk a little bit about your projects in Romancing the Home. Best title ever. (laughs) Sure. Um, I, I think it's very important that every project have a voice and a point of view. Uh, And I think you'll see that in this book, we try to include something for everyone. And by that, I mean, uh, we have a very traditional house in Scotland, you know, all the way to contemporary and modern projects in Spain and Manhattan. So I think it's very important that that projects uh, have a voice. And I think it's important with the client that you discuss the location of the project, what their goal is. And that team assembled, you know, works to achieve that goal. For example, very typical in in Manhattan, when I work on apartments, clients generally want uh, a fairly urban aesthetic or sensibility. And generally, the apartment's architecture supports that direction. But I have clients with very contemporary apartments in Manhattan who want very uh, traditional homes in the country. Uh, Or, for example, when my clients purchased a house in Scotland, you know, the direction was it should look like an English country house, uh, which fit the the architecture because it's a mid 19th century stone house, you know, on the water on the coast in Scotland. Uh, And so renovating it, you know, and installing white oak libraries and mahogany doors and uh, limestone floors suited that project. Um, whereas when I was hired uh, by another client to do a very contemporary house in Spain, you know, they wanted a very contemporary interior. You know, they didn't want antiques or vintage pieces. They wanted everything to be very, very modern, uh, including the artwork and objects, et cetera. Now, do you find that um, you're matching the exterior architecture of the house with the interior aesthetic of the house? Not always, um, but I think that um, the architecture and the location of the house definitely needs to be considered when you are um, talking about the interiors. So, you know, for example, I've done several houses in the Hamptons uh, or in beach communities, which tend to be shingle style vernacular. However, some clients, they say, you know, they love color and so they want the interior to be full of color and pattern, which is great for a summer house. But then I have clients who say, you know, similar style architecture who want something clean and serene and not over decorate. So, you know, it plays a role, but it's not always the defining element. So let me ask you about your upbringing. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Manhattan, uh, so I'm a native New Yorker, uh, and I, I went to school here you know, until I was about 15, and then I went away to boarding school and college. I spent a few years, well, several years, living in London, and a short stint out in L.A., and then came back to New York. Okay, so I read somewhere that your first big design job came at the age of 15. I'm dying to hear about that. When I was 15, my parents underwent a renovation of their house in Manhattan where I grew up. You know, coincidentally, I was at the right age, you know, and I was interested. I came home and met with my mother and the interior designer who was working on it. So it wasn't really my job, but it certainly sparked an interest 
in the field, and I was very interested in the selections that were being made um, and the results. That was where maybe the spark started, but there was a professional designer certainly employed to to work on the project. (laughs) Is your style still the same as it was when you were 15, helping out the interior decorator? Well, no. I mean, when I was 15, that was the the early 80s. Uh, And New York, as you can imagine, in the early 80s uh, was very involved. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Full of pattern. You know, I think the overriding designers of the day, you know, were still Parrish Hadley and Macmillan and uh, Mario Boada. And and there was a lot of print and chins um, and sort of a nod to an English interior or a modern English interior. Um, And so my style certainly evolved, as you've seen in the book, from that. And also, as I said, you you know, it's not just one source for inspiration, but, you know, the clients play a role, as does the project. Uh, And also, sometimes you set out goals that you'd like to achieve on a particular project. See, my personal style stuck in the 80s with the whole Mario (laughs) Buada. (laughs) The more is more. (laughs) Well, and that maximalism is still, you know, a, a strong design tendency today. Uh, I mean, you you know, you see it with a lot of designers, and uh, there are a lot of people who who love that. There's no example in my book of that maximalism interior design, but I'd love to do it. So I'm I'm waiting for a client to ask me to do that. In the introduction, you briefly mentioned Marion McAvoy, the former European editor of Women's Wear Daily and W, founding editor of Elle Decor and editor-in-chief of House Beautiful. How was she instrumental in your journey? Well, I met a Marion uh, when I was in graduate school. We had a lot of mutual friends, and she'd moved from Paris to New York to be the editor-in-chief of Elle Decor at the time. And um, she asked me if I could work on special projects with her, which was a great job offer. And uh, I was happy to do it. Uh, Marion and I, you know, got along very well, and we're still friends today. And it's fortunately, I still run into her at some industry events. But she, after about two years of working for Marion at El Decor, she wanted to introduce me to David Easton, who, you know, at the time in the late 90s was running you know, one of the main, you know, interior design offices in America. And I think there were probably 40 to 50 employees with interior designers and uh, architects, as he had had an architect who was a partner. And um, it was a thriving office, a lot of new construction, building great projects all over America. And uh, I was a little bit hesitant because I had no experience in interior design. But Marion, you know, with her great foresight and um, intuition said, well, I think, you know, having worked in the auction house and studying decorative arts in graduate school, that you would bring a lot to his office and that he would be, you know, able to teach you kind of the the basics um, of design. And so we had a meeting with David Easton and I had a couple of interviews with him after that. And on the second interview, I, he sent me home with some plans. And, you know, I started shortly thereafter. And that was, uh, I don't know, about 25, 26 years ago. So what are a couple of the basics that he taught you that you still use today? Well, you know, David was a master, truly, of interior design. Um, probably even not understood to his full potential even when he was working, because he was an architect by nature and did plans. And the overriding factor was always good architecture. So even if you were doing just an interior design job, the architecture of the space was always the most important. You know, I always refer to the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, because even though it's a public space, it's something that always leaves a lasting impression, but it's the architecture. And even in an apartment in New York, you can rework architecture to your advantage, either making things symmetrical or just balanced, replacing a mantle. But architecture was always the first. The second thing was every room, you had to start with the rug. And he taught me that when you build a room in interior design, you always start with the rug because everything has to look good on the rug. And um, also a rug shouldn't just be the right color or pattern. But, you know, when he felt when we went to look for rugs 
when the rug dealer unrolled it, he felt the rug should sing. You know, and I often compare it to going to the symphony that, you know, you hear uh, an instrument that can speak to you. And he he really had that reaction with rugs. And, um, you know, a rug defines a room in a way, even a contemporary room. You know, even if you're you're uh, using a, a sisal or a or, you know, a neutral textured rug, I mean, that still has a big impact on the rest of the room. So those were, I think, a couple of very significant elements he taught me. But then, of course, you know, you got into the weeds of details with how you distribute color around the room, patter around the room, you know, how you mix textures, and then, of course, details of how you trim certain pieces, you know, and that that in the end, you know, sort of by doing it with him for, for years and years, picked up a good sense of, of how to design and build a room. I think a great uh, rug example is on page 232 and 233 in your stunning Southampton home called Top O'Dune, Top O'Dune. Right. Uh, with its distinctive octagonal tower. And in the octagonal sitting room, you chose a geometric rug. Yes. Well, that's interesting because, of course, that project is a work in progress. Uh, it's a family home, and we all love the Pierre Frey print that's in the room. Um, and we wanted something that felt more contemporary uh, to complement it. And so I used um, that geometric rug, which is sort of a tone on tone, beige on white, um, which sort of sets an architectural framework, which, of course, everything looks good on the 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 bamboo furniture and um, the white sofas, as well as the Pierre Frey print. So the second legend you worked under was David Kleinberg, one of the most respected and celebrated names in interior design. With David, you learned about more contemporary designs, and he encouraged a breaking of the rules. Well, I mean, yes, David is a consummate professional and definitely a giant of design in in America today. Um, You know, his training with Parrish Hadley, so important, you know, and beyond being incredibly talented designer, he is also a businessman through and through. And, uh, you know, one part of the industry, which is often forgotten because people are so uh, consumed with design and color and, and uh, pattern um, is that it is a business. And, um, and David really taught me that um, and, you know, how to run a, a tight office. But I do recall, you know, in the early days of working for David Kleinberg, when I did schemes for him, you know, he was very complimentary, but it was sort of a, an underhanded compliment because he would say, well, Stuart, it's a very pretty scheme, but, you know, we need to shake it up a little bit. And he didn't want everything to be so perfect or match. And, you know, he encouraged me to have more fun. And I think that's where the sort of breaking the rules came from. It, it was a good influence on me just to, you know, relax a little bit and, and enjoy the process. The third legend who helped pave your design path was Bunny Williams. How was working with Bunny different from working with David Easton or David Kleinberg? Well, one way I can tell you, um, and I tell Bunny this all the time, is when I've worked for Bunny, I never worked so hard, but I never had so much fun, too. You know, Bunny's office was was probably one of the busiest offices I ever worked in. Um, and I don't, if you know Bunny, you know she's tireless. Um, she has more energy than everybody in her office combined and still thriving, you know, today. But, uh, you know, at that point, when I started working for Bunny, I, I kind of knew, the, you know, I had 10 years of experience and, um, you know, I knew, you know, how to put a project together um, and, and came with a fair amount of experience. So she, you know, gave me a certain amount of freedom, but she definitely wanted the projects done. You know, there was no sitting around, there was no wasting time. And we had fun. I mean, we worked on projects in, you know, Florida and in Virginia, and we did a lot of traveling together. And, um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, But she, she, you know, while supporting me, she sort of let me be my own designer at that point. 
In the foreword, Bunny recalls the time you were working as a designer for her. It was a Thursday morning. She saw your name on the calendar, but it wasn't attached to a client, and her heart skipped a few beats. Please fill us in on that meeting. Well, it's, you know, it's always a a tough meeting to have uh, with, you know, a boss uh, and your employer um, and somebody who you have a tremendous amount of respect for you know, in who you develop a relationship with. Um, and I love the team effort. And that's mm-hmm. probably one of the reasons why I worked for so many different offices. Um, needless to say, the offices I worked in, they were, you know, incredibly great designers. So, I mean, I really, it was a pleasure for me to have those experiences. But that was a very hard meeting for for me and um you know if bunny's heart was skipping a beat mine certainly was too but i i think bunny you know in the end knew that one day you know like anybody you have to spread your own wings and she's since while i was working in her office and today you know it's been incredibly supportive and she was so kind to write the forward to the book and she hosted the book launch in New York, you know, and she, to this day, you know, I, I consider her a great, great friend. And I love to see her and John whenever we have a chance. So when you speak to young designers, you encourage them to work for established decorators for as long as they possibly can. How come? Well, one of the things that is lost, I think, in the industry is mentoring. And I think what's interesting is that all the people I worked for, uh, you know, David Easton spent a few years working for Parrish Hadley. David Kleinberg worked for Parrish Hadley, I think, for 14 or 15 years, very closely with Albert. Uh, Of course, Bunny worked directly with sister Parrish uh, for many, many years. And that mentoring is uh, unparalleled. I mean, and I can't stress it enough. And I have had lunch with young designers who come out of design school or or they graduate and they really want to dive into interior design and they ask me for advice. And I said, well, you know, find somebody who's doing a project or has an aesthetic that you admire and you like. And I said, go work for them because, you know, there is so much you can learn about the industry. I think there is obviously... Uh, an innate or intuitive sense that drives you to this industry. Um, And the intuitive sort of core is not something anybody can teach you. You just have to have that. But if you do have that, there's a tremendous amount that people can teach you. Um, And as I said, it's not just about building a room, but it's also about, you know, running an office. And, you know, we all make mistakes. Everybody has made mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. And I think all the people I worked for had experience that they shared with me. And I was extremely fortunate that all of the people I worked for really, really shared their experiences with me. And when you combine the decades of experience of all of those people, that's a lot of information. And if you're smart, you know, you absorb it, you pay attention, you listen, you do your job, and you you know, you're better off for it. So I, I always recommend that to, you know, anybody who wants to get into the business. When you travel, you pick up on patterns that are part of other cultures around the world, and then you reinterpret them to fit a variety of projects. Your project in the Hamptons is loaded with pattern at every turn. So how do you go about incorporating the pattern? Pattern while not coming across too busy, which is something we all deal with. Um, well, I do love to travel and I do get inspired. You know, it's interesting. David Easton really taught me to look at motifs and um, elements of design. And so it's not always just the big picture, but, you know, look for smaller elements. And I had seen these Borneo prayer mats and I love the, the overall pattern of it. And I asked one of my finishers if we could interpret that for a stencil design, which we did use in the family room in that Hamptons project. And I love that. And I love stencil anyway. Um, And I also like being able to provide my clients with a custom pattern. So a lot of people, you know, will see it on social media and they'll say, oh, where can I get that wallpaper? Or 
you know, that's great. And, you know, it's a one of a kind. So, you know, I think it's better for for the result of my project, but also for my client. Also, um, you know, again, using stencil, I also like organic stencil. And um, I saw this kind of Americana series of organic flowers. And again, I took pictures and I showed the images to a, a, a decorative artist and asked if we could do that. And we ended up doing it on canvas. And we created, I think, five or six different stencil motifs and then used them in a random pattern. And then we we layered the pattern with mother of pearl and wax polish. And of course, the great room that I really loved that I did was the client who loved color wanted some pattern in her family room or library, you know, where the kids would watch TV and they had a card table. So they spent a lot of time in this room. And there wasn't, you know, any particular artwork that we were going to use in this room. And there were bookshelves and blank walls. And I'd been to the Matisse show and I'd seen a wonderful textile that would have been owned by somebody like Matisse when he was working on those cutouts. And I showed the textile to my client. I said, well, what if we did something like this, you know, as a wall pattern? And she was game. And um, so we did it. And of course, we could modify the colors to, you know, use colors that she really liked, but also they could be a little unexpected. And so we did the whole room sort of wrapped in this, you know, Matisse cutout that was based on a textile, which was a lot of fun. So before we go, I must ask you about the end papers. I adore that blue pattern. Is this a wall covering you created? Yes. I mean, that's actually the one that I did in the dining room in the Hamptons project where we layered it with Mother of Pearl. And when we were looking through the rooms, uh, the art director on the book said, you know, how much he he liked that pattern. And it seemed very distinctive and also representative of me um, because it was something that I had come up with. So um, we sort of modified it for the end papers. But I agree with you. I think it's very successful. It's so different. I mean, I I can't even describe it. It's lovely. It's gorgeous. But it's something that I've never seen before. Yeah. Well, and if you look in um, the book in the dining room um, of the Hamptons Project, you'll see the scale is actually much bigger. We had to reduce the scale for the scale of the book, but it's it's a very um, bold uh, and, and strong design in the room where I used it. Um, and I love the way it turned out. And I think it's it's very successful as the end papers as well. Where can we find you on the web and social media? Um, well, my website is stuartmangardesign.com. So anybody can go on the website and, and see my projects, press uh, a little bit about me and working for the different designers. Um, and then, of course, on social media, I'm, I'm on Instagram at Stuart Mangard Design, posting regularly images of projects that I'm working on and sometimes uh, posting old favorites and inspiration and travel, you know, and some fun daily pics. Well, this has been so terrific and inspirational. Thanks so much, Stuart, for coming on Decorating by the Book podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I enjoyed it tremendously. Follow Decorating by the Book on Instagram. And thanks for listening to the one and only interior design book podcast, Decorating by the Book.